Let's talk about support vector machines, which is one of my absolute favorite topics in machine learning. So most algorithms for classification are happy when they perfectly separate the data. Like as long as they have the positives on one side and the negatives on the other side, they're, they're happy. Like Perceptron will just stop once it has this. But not support vector machines. The whole idea behind support vector machines is that you should think carefully about which classifier you pick when the data are separable. So there could be a lot of classifiers that perfectly separate the data, but you know, which one should you pick? Now let's, let's think about this one right here. So this one doesn't seem like a particularly good idea, right? Because the line is so close to the points that it might not generalize well to test data, right? Even though it performs perfectly well on training data, as soon as you get more, you know, positive points from the positive cloud, uh, some of them might cross over the decision boundary. And so um, maybe they won't perform so well for test data, right? They won't perform well out of sample. Okay, so the cool idea behind support vector machines is that among all classifiers that separate the data perfectly, you should choose one that maximizes the margins between the um, decision boundary and the nearest training points. Okay, so you want all the points to be far from the decision boundary so that um, you know, if, if, the, if the test data are not exactly like the training data, which they're generally not, then hopefully you will still be able to classify them correctly. So another way of seeing that is that we want the minimum margin to be large. We want the minimum distance between the decision boundary and the training points to be large. Okay, so let me show you the margin perspective here. So I'm just plotting all the points with respect to the margin along this axis here. And as you can see, I've, uh, I've chosen a decision boundary really well so that all the points um, have margins that are more than some amount, right? They have a, a, all the points have this really large margin between the decision boundary and, and the points. Okay, now the minimum margin is the distance from the decision boundary to the nearest training observation. Okay, so we call that gamma. Now the way support vector machines are formulated is that you say, okay, we'll constrain all points to be farther than gamma from the decision boundary, and then we will maximize gamma. So in that way, we're just going to force all the points to be, you know, at least some distance gamma and we'll maximize that gamma. All right, so this is the, the functional, again, the functional way of showing this, and we want all the points to be correctly classified with at least a, a distance of gamma away from the decision boundary, and we're going to try and maximize that gamma. Okay, so, yeah, so it's nice and stable, and then when new points come in, Hopefully they'll be correctly classified. Okay, so here's our formulation so far. Maximize gamma such that all the margins are at least gamma. Now, this looks good so far, but we've forgotten something. And in particular, this is actually bad. Um, so the, this, the answer to this problem is always infinity. Okay, this is a, a, um, an ill-posed problem and we have, we have forgotten about handling that ill posedness. So let me tell you exactly what happened here, what mistake we made. So um, let's say that we have a function that just barely separates the points. Like you get the positives right next to the decision boundary, the negatives are way over on this side, but like it's just really close to the decision boundary. So the margins are actually really small. Okay, so um, they're really small. In fact, I'm going to just put a point 0.1 there. So it's, it's the margin's point 0.1. I'm just putting that number as small just so that you can get the sense that it's, it's a small number. So let's say that I want my margins to be a million times bigger. So what I can do is just multiply that by a million and just, you know, the question is, can I, can I create a function f that satisfies this? And I can, because all I have to do is take my function value and multiply it by a million and then I'm <laughs> and then I've got my margin to be a million times bigger. So that's where the problem lies. That this whole thing, um, it, it just doesn't understand the fact that f can be scaled and all the classifications can stay the same. Okay, so this is a problem and we need to deal with this somehow. So we're going to do the oldest trick in the book, which is to normalize the function f. So no matter how big you scale f, I'm always going to scale it back down before I compute the margin. So what I'll do is um, instead of margin being y times f, it'll be y times the normalized f. 
So what, again, whatever you scale f to, I'll, I'll normalize it back down by dividing by somehow some measure of the size of f. And that measure of the size of f is going to be a norm. And I haven't told you what norm it is. I will. Okay, so we say all the normalized margins are at least gamma, and then we're going to try and maximize gamma. So this should solve the issue. So I'm just putting the norm on the other side there. Nothing fancy. And then I'm going to make two choices. They are both modeling decisions. The first one fixes a scale. The second one allows the functional margin to be equal to the geometric margin. So um, I will go over both of these. <laughs> so let me talk to you about the scale first. Um, the scale is here. So what I'm doing is forcing gamma to obey that the norm of f times gamma equals 1. Okay, that 1 came out of nowhere. I could have chosen 10. I could have chosen pi. I could have chosen like 20,000. I could have chosen whatever I want, but I chose 1. And uh, it doesn't matter what you, what you choose here. It's just, much, it's just very convenient to choose 1. And then I'm making some modeling decisions for f. So f is going to be a linear model. The coefficients are going to be called lambda. And as usual, I classify using the sine of f. And then the norm of f, I'm going to choose that to be the L2 norm of the lambda coefficients, which, the, as, the, as you know, the L2 norm is just the, the, the sum of the squares of the lambdas, and then you take the square root of the whole thing. Um, there is one technical issue that I need to point out to you, because it's important, which is that the intercept term, the lambda zero term, actually gets handled separately by support vector machines. So the norm, that norm that you're seeing right there, that only handles the coefficients that actually multiply the features for SVM, right? The lambdas that actually multiply the, the x's. Um, the intercept term, the lambda zero, is not included in this norm and will get handled separately. Okay, so in other words, what I'm saying is that for a linear model, I'm measuring, um, I'm measuring the size of it by something kind of related to its slope, right? In one dimension, that lambda would be the slope, and then I'm not including the intercept term. Now these two choices taken together mean that gamma is now equal to 1 over the L2 norm of the lambdas. Now if you think about gamma being a margin, and you think about lambda being a slope, because, you know, in obviously in one dimension it is the slope, then you should know here that the margin is inversely related to the slope. So margin, and then the slope is, you know, one over that. So uh, that intuition is actually very helpful, and I will go into that more um, in the next slide because it all becomes much clearer in one dimension. So I'm going to talk a lot about, about one dimension. And also, uh, I, should, I should, you know, I, I'm going to give you some more geometric intuition because here I've talked about the functional margin and the geometric margin being different. So a func the functional margin is y times f. The geometric margin is the actual distance, physical distance between, or Euclidean distance, between the decision boundary and the nearest point. And I will talk about how those two things are actually equivalent to each other. So I've left a couple of open mysteries. And it again, it will all become much clearer in one dimension.